All I can say is that is one of the most powerful messages, stories, movies, films, just one of the most gut-wrenching things that I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen a couple of things. <laughs> You know, one of the rewards I have for being the oldest living person on television, with the exception of Andy Rooney, <laughs> keep at it, Andy, we need you, buddy, <laughs> is that I now work a lot <laughs> with the children of my friends. <laughs> I knew Davis's father. He was a friend of mine, and he was a great filmmaker. But Davis, I want to tell you, he would have been proud of you. Davis Guggenheim, come on out here. What a show. Leslie Chilcutt is the uh, producer of this film. Uh, she was also the producer of An Inconvenient Truth. Davis, of course, won an Oscar for that. Leslie, come on out here. And you know, how many times have you, have you been to the movies and you said, I just wish I could talk to that character. I wish I could talk to the person in the movie and ask a question. Tonight we get to do that. Here is Jeffrey Canada. And I want you to save a little bit for Eric Adler, the seed school guy. Eric. Huh? And then perhaps someone who has done as one single person who has done as much for education in this country as any person, Bill Gates. I tell you what I'm going to do tonight. I've introduced these people, and I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way, because these are the people that you need to hear from. And uh, Davis, I, I just want to ask you, how did you come to this project? How did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Well, uh, uh, Diane Wireman, who's here, is the head of participant um, and, and funds of these movies, she, fun she and, and Jeff Skoll and uh, participant funded In Community Truth, and she called and she said, we would like to do a film about public education. And it was August, I was on vacation, and I said, I don't think you can do it. It's just too complicated. It's, it's, um, it's complex, and I don't see a way through it. I don't see a story. And um, it was August, and I, uh, two weeks later, I went home, first, first, day, first week of school, and I was getting my kids ready for school, backpacks, juice, pencils, and putting them in the car, and I was driving them to school, and on the way I passed Westminster School, which is my, the public school they would go to, and then another school, and then another, on the way to take them to a wonderful school. And that idea of, of driving by these schools and not going in uh, uh, and taking my kids to another a wonderful school, made, it just haunted me. And the, the, the premise that I came up, up with in my head was, how do I get people to care about other people's children? You know, is it enough for me to send my kids to a great school? But what about, what about the kids in the schools that aren't working? And if I made a movie with that intention, well, then maybe we could fix this thing. And Leslie, now that you look back on this, you know, I mean, as a reporter, every time I've covered a story, I, come, I usually come away, any story that I remember, the thing I remember is I learned something. I found out something. What did you come away from this with? I think before the film, I, I had uh, realized the importance of teaching uh, to a very, very tiny extent. I had taught myself in Japan for a while. 
And I knew that, of course, teachers are important. And who doesn't have a story of a third grade or a sixth grade teacher or a science teacher that made science interesting? Or, a, or when I first learned that a book could be read on more than one level, <laughs> this, was, this was a big deal to me. But what I, I didn't realize was that as a country, we do not properly value our teachers. We do not encourage our teachers. We do not say to 12-year-olds, this is what you should be. One of the best jobs you can have in the entire world is to be a teacher. And we do not say that teaching is cool. Now, there, of course, there are cool teachers out there, and they're wonderful teachers. But we don't say that as a society. And that was the biggest, the, the biggest thing that I learned. And, and it's the biggest thing that, that I would like people to take away from this film is that teachers, like Jonathan Alter says, teachers are heroes, and teachers are extremely important. Jeffrey, how many people do you suppose told you along the way that you couldn't do this, that this wasn't, this wasn't possible? Well, you know, I, I think the thing that's so uh, striking to me about this film uh, is that it shows to the country uh, that there are a bunch of people who are really going in places where people have given up on these kids and are really uh, proving uh, that you can save these kids. And you can save all the kids, uh, which is something that we all learned in school to say. It's sort of the politically correct thing. All children can learn. People say that. Then you ask, well, why aren't half of them? And then people have all of these excuses. And the excuses have a science behind them. There are people who actually uh, study and prove why these kids can't make it. And those of us in the business were taught that that was the truth. Uh, I think we are breaking through those molds and saying to folk, there is no science that says these kids can't make it. It's just that the adults haven't really done the right thing. And I think that's, that's incredibly important. Uh, there were huge numbers of folk uh, who said when we weren't going to create our zone in Harlem, uh, that you just couldn't do it. New York City was too out of control. It was crime. It was drugs. It was all of this sort of stuff. Uh, and now I think people say, well, you're the only one who can do it, right? <laughs> and, 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 but it's true, because that's what people say. And it's not true. It's not true the same way they said when Kip, you could only do one school, and now they've got schools all over the country. Uh, it is hard work, but it can be done. And so I think the onus is on us to really go out uh, and save these kids. Eric, tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your schools, because you have taken a little bit different approach. I think it's so interesting, this, this boarding school concept. Why did you come up with that? Um, I came up with it uh, early in my career. My first job was teaching high school physics. And I was in a private school, but I saw some kids come in on scholarship, and I saw the experience that they were having. And, uh, you know, you'd have one child who had a three-bus, 90-minute commute home, and no father in his life. Mom maybe had three jobs or maybe had an alcohol problem or whatever it was. There was a lot going on there, younger sister, younger brother to take care of. And I just thought, and then the kid in the desk next door had a 10-minute ride home, and he would get home, and dinner was ready, and he'd go up to his room. And if he had trouble with his homework, he could come down and ask his parents for help. And, and then the next morning, he'd get up and put on clean clothes that somebody else had cleaned and drive 10 minutes back to school. And I said, that there's no way that this kid can compete unless he's, uh, remarkably, I actually said, unless he's Superman. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, what would you have to do to level the playing field? Well, you've got to get rid of that commute, and you've got to give him all the same supports that this other kid has at home, and, and one thing leads to another, and you go, I think a boarding school is going to be the answer. We're going to need to control the clock 24 hours a day. At 9 o'clock at night, we have to know that that child is reading or doing homework, and if he's having trouble with his homework, he can get help. And so that's where the idea came from. I, I just want to underscore one last thing that Jeffrey said, which is that there is this sense that it's one charismatic leader, and... If, if you don't have the charismatic leader, then you can't do it. And uh, I think Kip puts, put the lie to that. I, I think that Jeffrey is, is pushing down what he's doing to a, to a very talented staff. We have two schools operating now, and we are going to open another one soon, and then we're going to open some more. I, I think it's not true. It is hard. It's, it's a difficult entrepreneurial venture, but it can be done. Hey Bill, I'm, you know, I thought you brought out such a, a great point. It, Obviously, it's about educating our kids, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about the security of this country and where this country is going to be in 20 years if we don't get this part of it solved. Just give me your thoughts on that. I mean, 
you saw the movie with the rest of us here. Where are we? How did we get to this place that we're in? And is there a way out of it? Well, when Melinda and I were deciding what our foundation would focus on, uh, we decided to pick something big globally, and that's where the health stuff came in. And then we looked in the U.S., where we wanted to have something uh, ambitious that we were doing there, uh, because this is the country that created the framework for the, the success or the resources to be gathered. And it was very obvious that he, if you looked at the individual level, what would improve this country the most? Or if you looked at the macro level, what would improve the, the performance of the country the most? It was education. And just like global health, when you first get involved, you have to be brought down to the truth. So you get told the majority of minority kids drop out of school. And it's, that's so foreign to my experience that you say, no, no, that's, that just can't be true. You're just kidding. Check that again, will you? And <laughs> they say, yeah, you know, and there's schools in LA that 70% drop out. The nation's capital is the dropout capital of the world. Uh, and it, it just blows the mind where you say, well, why aren't people politically activated to, the, against this great injustice? And that's uh, a complex thing. Anyway, we were drawn into it. It's, you know, it's a tough problem. Fortunately, there are rays of light. Uh, whenever you're depressed, you know, go and see one of these high-performance schools, which fortunately there are more and more. Uh, we just had the National Charter Convention was in Chicago a week ago, uh, and they are very ambitious about uh, driving charters to a higher level. And if you ever think it's easy, then you just go to one of the dropout factories and see you know, that they're spending more per student in the dropout factory than they're spending in the, the high-performance charter. And you, know, you say, well, but why? Why are we spending more there than in the other place? And uh, the beauty of the movie is it does, it, it educates you on both the individual injustice as well as this broad thing of you know, what does it mean for the, the country in this claim of, of equal opportunity. You know, Davis and, um, and Leslie, I mean, I thought one of the most powerful, I mean, this is such a well-told story. I mean, it, it is, and that is where the power comes in and the way you have told this. And it seems to me that, the, to me, the most gut-wrenching part of this was watching those lotteries. How did you, how did you come up with that concept and, and what was that like to be there? Well, the, 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 the roots uh, of that idea come, uh, have roots in the Aspen Ideas Festival. I, I, um, we, Leslie and I were already making the film and trying to figure out what the essential metaphor was. And we re I was reading the New York Times one morning and I read Tom Friedman's incredible piece on the lottery at, at Eric's new school. Eric and, and Raj is here tonight, I think, um, the co-founders of Seed. And they talked about... Um, Tom, in, in his incredible way, talked about how gut-wrenching it was. He saw families win and he saw families lose. And, um, and I saw that as a great metaphor and a great vehicle for the movie. Um, and uh, uh, I, sat, I came in for the last 20 minutes of the movie, it made me cry today. It, 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 it's, it, it, just is, it just feels so wrong. And it feels un-American. Uh, and you could, you could get caught up in, oh, well, it's all about lotteries, it's all about this, but in the essential thing is you've got a kid who has a dream. Daisy wants to be a doctor. Anthony wants to do right by his grandmother. And what are the things in the way of that dream? And, uh, uh, and Jeffrey can speak to it in a very visceral way of, 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 uh, in, your, in the book Whatever It Takes about um, having to deal with parents who don't get in. You know, it's, 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 it's gut-wrenching. What was it like for you, Liz? I, I have now seen through making various copies of the film, you know, these days there's an HD version, there's a digital cinema version, there's a film version. I have probably seen the movie 150 times. I have to walk out and sometimes have our assistant editor watch the lottery session because, you know, I was there that day. And you know, at some point, you're just saying, 
forget the film. I have to do something. I have to get every one of these kids, you know, in the, I have to get every single kid in. I'll tell you, um, I cannot watch this film without crying uh, because in about two weeks we're going to have our lottery. Uh, and I'm going to go and there will be more people than this in our gym. Uh, and I will see tears and I will see people whose dreams are just shattered over their little kids. Uh, and it's just absolutely devastating. I hate it, by the way. Uh, I wouldn't do a lottery if we weren't forced to by law. I just think it's kind of cruel and unusual uh, because everybody comes in, you know, calculating their chances and they're looking around and think, you know, I got a shot at this. And as those numbers go and you just begin to see real despair, uh, it's a very, very sad thing. It, it reminds me of, of something, though, which is uh, another big lie that some people don't care about educating their kids. Right? You get this sense, well, they don't really care about their kids. And, and, and you know, those, those folks don't really want to go out. They're not going to work as hard. People really care. They have, no, they have no choice. If you give people no choice, if you know it doesn't matter where I send my kid, the schools are all terrible. Right? Then people say, okay, well, you know, it is. But you say, look, there's a shot, there's a choice here that your kid could make it. Everybody understands what that means in America, right? It's my kid. Uh, I want the best for my kid. I know what's going to happen through education. It's the only hope this kid has. And then in that one, you know, it takes us about two and a half hours. You go from elation to seeing most of the people leaving really depressed. And to okay. put it in perspective, excuse me, there, uh, there are many, many more neighborhoods with failing schools with no lottery, right. with no chance at getting a good school. Yeah, at Seed, um, our first school has been operating for 12 years. We're about to go into our 13th, so it's had 13 lotteries. Our second school has had two years of operations and a third year that we've done the lottery. So I, we've lived through 16 lotteries, and, and Raj and I always go because it reminds us exactly why we do what we do. And uh, there are two things about it, each so terrible and simultaneously so wonderful that it makes it, uh, I have to tell you, the most, in many ways, the most important thing of the year uh, for us, which is um, obviously watching families not get in is just a terrible thing. And, and you don't do what we do day in and day out and devote yourself to it without caring deeply about giving opportunity to kids. And when you see the opportunity snatched away from the child, I, I have to tell you, it is really, at one level, it is brutal. Then you also see in that very pain the reason why you're doing what you're doing, because you've created an opportunity that didn't used to be there. So, you know, a lot of times, again, if, if, if anything good could come out of this film, you know, what would be your top five things? High on my list would be somebody sees this film and becomes another social entrepreneur and builds another great school, because we got to build more. We've got to, because there are so many kids out there who deserve nothing but a great education. So it is, a, it is just one of the most remarkable experiences. I, I actually, this year, for the first time, brought my children to the Seed School Lottery in Maryland. Um, my children, at the time of the lottery, were uh, six and nine. And um, I got to tell you, even at six and nine, they kind of get it. I mean, this is, this is as raw a human drama as you will ever live through. Bill, if uh, the last time I looked, the Gates Foundation had uh, given away something like $16.6 billion, which is an astounding figure. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the, the, the funds that you're devoting to education now, and uh, what do you think are the things that are working? What are the things, what have you found out? And what's not working? Well, it's amazing that the whole charter thing only started in 1992. And 70% um, of charter schools are less than 10 years old. So this is quite a new movement. And early in the movement, there were a lot of one-off schools 
that some of which were not good, some of which were good, some of them that were good did not scale, that is when they tried to make multiple schools it didn't work. And so there's a lot of learning that went on there. Um, the many states have not been good about shutting down low performance charters. So, you know, after you leave here, you may see an article that says charters overall aren't that great. You know, Diane Ravage, uh, various people promoting that. There is, a, there is truth to that. That is, charters are vastly overrepresented in the top 10% of all schools, and they are vastly overrepresented in the bottom uh, 10%. If you properly adjust for the kids they take and things like that, they are actually higher performing. But the key point is that if you take the, the charter management organizations, CAT, KIPP, YES, Aspire, Green Dot, High Tech High, there's 12 that are particularly good, they are performing the miracle and they're all growing. So the first thing is try to make sure that the regulations, the reimbursement rates, not, uh, facilities, nothing holds back these charters from growing as fast as they can. Now that, if we do the best we can, that'll be 10% of American schools in about 12 years. Uh, and that's great, because it has a catalytic effect. You know, in, in places like Houston, where you're 5% charters, over half the kids go to college come from that 5%. So it really is a, a gigantic thing. And you have some cities, New Orleans, DC, uh, where you're really getting to a critical mass uh, uh, type effect with those. But then the question is, what about the over 90% of kids who go to those public schools? Uh, on Saturday, I'm keynoting a teachers union convention, American Federation of Teachers, which is uh, a little less than half the teachers. It's more of the urban areas than uh, the other one, the National Education Association. And the, there's this big question of, are they drawn into teacher improvement and teacher measurement? You know, they were born to defend teachers against arbitrary action. And that was a valid thing. But if you take that to an extreme, you're not involved in improving excellence. In fact, in the extreme, like the rubber room, you're defending the absolute worst. Uh, and you know the club or the group, the union, I'm supposed to say union, uh, is always going to have, have some of that. So how do you change that? We're involved in a lot of experiments in teacher measurement, feedback using videos, using student surveys, using test scores. We have four districts uh, that we put 400 million in, and the, the union's involved in those, and trying to change the nature of the profession. So when you go into a teacher's file, instead of having nothing like you have today, you know, OK, you're good with high performance students, but not low performing. You're not good at keeping the classroom calm. You're better at teaching these concepts. And a whole notion of what you're trying to improve on, and that, that does not exist today. Uh what will you tell them when you keynote this speech? <laughs> I, there, the, at the end of the day, if the majority of teachers don't like the measurement system, you lose. So the, you know, the voters should be more active on this. What Arne Duncan, as Secretary of Education, with strong backing of the president has done with Race to the Top and everything is absolutely fantastic. But at the end of the day, the teachers union will be there every year. You know, when this movie is not in the theaters, the teachers union will be there. So you have to win inside the teachers union. You have to create within that group a battle of what do we stand for. And the AFT has um, embraced modest uh, change. And the four districts we're in, two of them are AFT districts where the union's involved. Colorado passed a law. DC, the contract after great difficulties went through. And so there are people in the AFT, including Randy Weingarten, who runs it, who are open-minded to this kind of improvement. Now, you have to have cases where it's worked, where if, the, the dream is that in the four districts, the teachers who work there will say, wow, this was not high overhead. This was not capricious. This helped me improve. It got rid of some teachers, but it got rid of the ones you know, 5 to 10% who shouldn't be in this profession. They should be in another profession. If those four districts then go to the other districts and say that, then we'd be on our way. Now, that's, that's a dream. Davis, what happened in, uh, uh, in Washington? 
in the district schools, uh, the Michelle Ree uh, initiative there and the proposal of why, why did it collapse? Well, it's interesting, uh, and Bill just re referenced it. At the end of the movie, you see sort of a deadlock, um, which is more, again, more of a metaphor of, of seeing a reformer deal with trying to make reform and the system just sort of absorbing it. But since then, and Bill, just, and Bill probably could talk about the, the contract better than I can, um, uh, several weeks ago, the teachers ratified a new contract, which is about half of what Michelle is looking for. Is that fair to say? Half to two-thirds, yeah. And it's, but you wouldn't have imagined it a year ago. And there is an amazing new contract in Denver that you wouldn't have imagined a year ago. So what Leslie said at the beginning of this movie, before the movie began, it feels like a moment. It feels like things are shifting. Um, and um, it feels like Randy is feeling that, Randy Weingarten, and, um, and she's been in some Q&As with us, and she's feeling, and I got a sense that Bill's instincts are right, that there's a, um, a generational shift inside the unions where they're, that they don't want to be on the wrong side of this. But it also takes, I think, people in this room to go back to where you live and demand that other people see the movie and demand that this becomes the most important issue at the school board and demand that... That, that uh, and parents demand that their schools be better, you know, and if, because of, because the other, the, the missing person at the table, the unions at the table, the other missing people at the table are people in the neighborhoods demanding great schools. And that's really why we made the movie, is, you know, we made In Community Truth to get political will. We didn't make it for the experts, we made it for regular people who see that this is happening and, and demanding great schools. And so if you get that pressure from parents and neighborhoods, you get the, 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 and then teachers start to say it from within, then the work that Jeffrey and Eric are doing becomes a whole lot easier. All right, we're gonna go to the, we're gonna go to the audience for questions now, but I wanna emphasize questions. You're all gonna be reporters. Reporters ask questions. <laughs> so who'd like to ask a question right here? How was, did he choose the children that they followed in the film? So the question is, how do we cho choose the children? And, and one of the things that comes up a lot is, well, you pick the nice parents. You pick the parents that care. And you pick the good kids, the kids that, that have big dreams. And to me, there's something, there's a kind of a, a subtle prejudice behind that question. And I, you go into a neighborhood and you go to a school and it's impossible to find them. And Jeffrey, you know this better than I do a mother who doesn't really want the most for their kids. So it wasn't that difficult to find these kids. We wanted, a, we wanted a, a different parts of the country, we wanted different ages, different schools, um, and it really wasn't sort of filtering out different types of people. It, but um, ultimately we knew that each kid needed to end up in a lottery. So we, we looked at schools that had lotteries and, and kids that were applying. And, uh, and the kids that were most photogenic, not photogenic, but open, and uh, to, to being shot, uh, we used. All right, the lady right here. How can you get this passion and this commitment of the Army young men and the veterans and the uh, to get behind you? Who'd like to answer that? Well, I mean, Bill, I, would you want to say something? Well, the administration is doing everything they can. And it's a good situation because the, the teachers, un, having this administration, the Democratic administration, tell the teachers union they need to shift somewhat what they stand for is more powerful than having a public administration do it. And you know they're under a lot of attack by saying how, particularly when state budgets are tight, when there's layoffs, how could you possibly say that we need to improve? And race to the top included improving the charter rules. So I don't think Arnie or, or even President Obama really could be doing much more. What he needs is more grassroots support at the state level. You know, Florida had a law that was a teacher measurement law. Governor Crist vetoed it. So this is definitely, for all the advances we're making, you know, two steps forward, one step back, education is a local issue. Uh, the, most of the funding is local. All the standards are local. You know, people, who gets elected to the school board? Teachers union people get elected because they care. And so if, if there's a missing piece, I'd say it's more in local activation than, than federal. But Jeffrey? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I would really agree with that. I would say that 
Uh, one of the things that we've really got to do is to get, uh, I think, the public to be aware of uh, how absurd uh, some of uh, this system is. I mean, you know, Bill's talking about a system where we're asking people to actually understand what it is that you do for your job. What do you do well and what do you do? And, and, the, and, and, the, and the response is no, we don't want to understand that, right? So, you know, it's like, it's like you, you bake a cake and, and if, 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 if you're a teacher, whether anyone likes the cake or not is totally irrelevant. No one wants to eat the cake and that's like tough. You don't have to figure out what the ingredients are, why is it the cook, is it, are you undercooking? It's just like fine. This is crazy. I wouldn't care if kids were doing fine. I wouldn't care if, if the country could afford to continue doing this. This is not revolution. We are talking really basic changes, and it's so unbelievable that if someone just told you it, you wouldn't believe it. You'd say, get out of here. That's how many, do you know how many teachers there are in this country? That you could have a system where you don't even know what you're doing if it's making any difference. Yeah, right. By law. You can't, in New York, they decided you pass a law, you can't evaluate teachers based on performance. It's like crazy. Uh, it's the only place that you could do that. So, we just gotta get people to understand that, you know, uh, the film isn't like a fairy tale, right? He didn't make this up. This is real life here in America, and we need to do something about it. And, and, and I agree that, that there is a political element to this, and I agree with Bill that it is much more at the state and local level than it is at the federal, which isn't to say that there isn't a federal component, but I think it is more state and local. And I, I think that for the average citizen, that is the single headline issue, is um, state and local elections. Um, but also for a very powerful, wealthy person with access, I think, uh, A, again, you have access to politicians and, and, and these same issues apply. But B, and I just think this is really important, I think great innovation in any field comes from great entrepreneurs. And if you have the ability to make an impact, one of the most important ways you can do that is to support great entrepreneurs, great education entrepreneurs. People like Jeffrey and people like the Kip guys, and I'd like to say people like the Seed guys. And, <laughs> but, but I also want to say it's not just limited to those of us who are starting new little, I mean, I think Michelle Rhee is very entrepreneurial. I think that the things that we do to support great entrepreneurs will produce great change. Question, right here. The question is, what about the economics of charters, about paying teachers and so on? Uh, so let, let, me, let me start in broad and then come narrow and talk about our own school. Broadly, charters are, really don't spend more uh, per child. Usually, it's less per child than what you get in public education. When they calculate the rate in New York City, they leave off about four or $5,000 worth of expenses uh, that go into retirement and building and all of those kinds of things. So you get a kind of an artificially lower price that charter schools then get even less than that. Uh, many charter schools supplement their funding by raising private dollars. And, and a lot of us run, uh, you know, my schools are open through the first week of August, so we run a longer school day. We pay, and I think this is probably pretty standard, we pay about 10% more in salary than you would make as a regular public school teacher. So your public school teacher, you have a master's degree and 10 years experience and you make uh, $58,000, we'll put an extra you know, $5,000 on top of that. But we work you about 35 or 40% longer a uh, year, so you actually end up getting ripped off. But don't, <laughs> don't, don't tell my teachers that though. They don't, they're not too good with math sometimes. So. Uh, no. It's actually not true. You have to, the one thing that people really know, and, and I think this is, this is, this is a real problem, uh, because uh, one of the big challenges, and I, I think Bill is right, uh, this is really going to be about public education and whether or not we can move the public system. Uh, one of the big challenges is that we have told teachers that teaching is so demanding you can only do it nine months out of the year, and then you need three months off. Right? And the people really believe They taught me that at Harvard. And it was like real. And people believe that, and, and regardless of whether or not children are succeeding. And so some of us have longer school years. Some of us need residential programs. 
And there are additional costs that go along with that. Uh, I think finding the people who do it's going to be important. But, and, and if I could just say, um, his teachers know the deal they've got. And, yeah. and I think it's, you know, uh, when you look at job satisfaction surveys, compensation is not the top item on the list. Uh, if you care about urban education and you want to see it work, you want to be in an environment where it's working, where your colleagues are working together, where you're seeing kids make progress, that's worth a lot to you. We struggle to keep up our pay scale in Washington, our Washington school, to look like the DCPS pay scale, and now Michelle has just gotten this contract that's <laughs> going to bring in a whole bunch of new money, and, and we're figuring out how we're going to try to compete with that. A and it's very important that we also create an environment for our teachers where they are succeeding at doing the things that they wanted to do. At some level, uh, you know, we're asking teachers to devote themselves to kids the way you would devote yourself to your own kids. Uh, uh, psychologists are, have for decades been talking about the fact that child rearing your own kids is by definition an irrational act, right? To, to devote yourself to other people's children, the way you devote yourself to your own is, is doubly irrational, and that's what we ask teachers to do. And the only way we can do, there's no amount of money that you can pay somebody to make that equation work. The only way it works is to find somebody who somehow wants to do that and then put them in an environment where they can and it works and they get satisfaction from it. Leslie, what was uh, the most surprising thing you found uh, as you got into this story? Uh, obviously, I think, all, I'm sure you found it was worse than you, even you thought it was. Absolutely. when you got into it. I mean, that's kind of a given here. Absolutely. But. Well, something that Davis started to touch on um, when people ask, how did you find parents that care? Um, we, to sort of continue with, with your question, we went to uh, parent orientation. And Harlem Success Academy, the biggest lottery in terms of the number of people that, that go to it in the film, would have them twice a week on Saturdays. Everyone we went to, and we were trying to recruit kids and families. Um, there was no shortage of finding people. Every session was completely packed. Um, we went to some sessions at Seed. We went with Kip in LA and followed them through parks as they handed out flyers and we met families. I mean, the extent to which all of you go to to find these students is amazing. I did not meet one parent that didn't care. And the only difference may be that some of them don't, just don't know that they have the power to do something. That part of the equation is missing, but they know if there's one thing that they can do, that is to get their kid in a better school. So I, I, I thought that that was very heartening, and I was really surprised that some people come in, and I heard stories, we didn't find this, where people couldn't even fill out applications, but they knew they would ask for help and someone else helped them with their application, and they knew that if it was the one thing that they could accomplish. I think there was a hand right over here. Right here. Go ahead. Um, so I read Malcolm Gladwell's description, and it's like a lot of work. Yeah. It seems like a, a lot of work. And... Um, you know, I know a lot of private schools, and it's not that much work. Uh, why is that? Uh, why, why is it more work in uh, some in schools than other schools? And, and I think uh, a lot of it has to do with where young people come into schools, what their preparation has been at home, what the preparation and their environment. You have young people who are uh, not just struggling with not having uh, academically rich environments. They, they don't have parents that have sophisticated use of language. They don't grow up speaking proper English, so they almost have to be taught English as a second language because no one spoke it in the way that you are supposed to speak uh, English. Then that makes it an additional burden, uh, I think. Uh, but I, I will tell you this. One of the things you have to ask yourself is, why does it cost so much to have a private school? What is it that costs so much about a private school where people are paying a lot more in private schools than they're paying in public schools? You know what they're paying for? Great teachers. That's what they're paying for. And it takes great teachers. And part of the issue, great teachers with disadvantaged kids do great work, and great teachers with kids who are advantaged do great work. And the opposite holds true. You get really lousy teachers in those private schools, 
it's going to be a lot of work. Malcolm will be writing about those schools, all right? <laughs> uh, I'm just telling you, it, it, it really matters. And you can attract great teachers, right, at private schools. That's one of the things the heads of private schools do really, really well, is they know that this is all about the staff, and they get the great staff in there. I have promised that we will wind this up uh, on time, and I think the way to do this is I'm just going to go down the line here, and I don't know which end to start. I would like for each of our panelists to give this audience one thing you would like for them to take away uh, from this evening that we, we've had here tonight. You want to start, Davis, or do you sure. want to start, Bill? Well, um, I'm happy to start. Uh, I'm, I'm really worried about this movie. Uh, Leslie and I have made three together. Um, it's by far the, uh, and I've done a lot of different movies, it's by far the most um, the audience has the most extreme reaction. It's, it's powerful. But I'm worried that people will read about it in the paper and they'll say, that's really interesting, and they won't go. It happens. We're, uh, we're a society now with 100 choices, and you might end up going to the next George Clooney movie instead of our movie. I believe that if people go see this movie, they will change their behavior, they will invest some way in ways I can't even imagine. Fixing a local school, fixing the system, but getting involved. My fear is that we have a good movie and it just won't get seen. And so what I would ask of you is, to, in any way you can in the facilities you have, bring a friend to opening weekend. Go on our website, Waiting for Superman, and pledge to see the movie. Show Paramount you're interested. And if you really care, opening weekend, bring a school bus full of People, because if the movie opens, people start to write about it. People go home and say, you got to see this movie. And it starts a tidal wave, like we did on Inconvenient Truth. If people don't go see the movie, then we just made a nice movie, and, um, and this potential is lost. Uh, two things. One is, when, when Bill says there's a disproportionate uh, number of charters that are doing really well and not doing so well, um, the ones that are doing well, it, at Jeffrey's school, his third graders, I mean, just guess the number that are proficient in math, just any, anyone, it's a very high number. 100, 100% 100 of the third graders are proficient in math, not 99, not 98, 100. Seven blocks away, Harlem Success Academy, 100% of their third graders are proficient in math. So these are not one-off incidents. These, there are 8,000 kids, and the number's growing, that are going to Harlem Children's Zone right now. There are 88 KIPs. There's going to be 105 next year. Eric and Raj are opening new schools. So I would like people to realize, you know, a lot of, a lot of people say, well, that happened here, and that happened here, and that happened here. This is happening all over. And <coughs> if everyone here gets involved, the second thing is, I would ask you, is to get 20 people, each person in this room, get 20 people to pledge to see the movie. The reason we ask this isn't just self-serving reasons. It's because we feel that the movie is a teaching tool. And the more people that see it, the more they will understand that you do have the power to do something and that you can share it with others. So I'm, my, my ask is that we really demand of our, uh, I think, our towns, our uh, cities, our communities, uh, equal access for all children. Uh, and it is only granted through education. Uh, and it is our issue as a democracy. You know, New York City has one of the largest uh, school populations in the country. Rikers Island is the largest penal institution in the world, in the world, right in New York City. Those two things are directly connected. Uh, one case, got great schools. Another case, we've got tens of thousands of people that we're warehousing because they got a lousy education and nobody cared. No one did anything. People thought you couldn't do anything. Now we know you can do some stuff. And I think this is a crisis and we need to go out and demand equal access for all of the kids in America. You know, I mean, I think it's the danger here is that uh, the failures of our education system can come off as uh, an intellectual problem. And uh, we've got to care enough to stick with the things that it takes to find solutions, to drive people into careers that will make 
great schools, to fund great entrepreneurs, and all of those things take caring a lot. I think the, the way to make a difference is uh, to go visit uh, the great charter schools in your area. There's a program being put together to make that systematic where you can go up uh, to the movie website and then find out in your area who is and there'll be a sort of a regular day each month for that. I do think people need to get involved in those charters, both giving and helping out. And they do need to think about why the whole school board approach isn't working and why today what the union stands for isn't working and how they can help that change. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, I think I, think I would speak for everyone here, and I never presume to do that. But I think this is a, an evening that none of us will ever forget. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>